Okay, uh, thanks everybody for still showing up here after those cookies and, and chips that we just had. Uh, I'm sure everybody's fired up, I can see that. <laughs> Anyways, thank you very much for, for stopping by. Um, uh, my name is Mario Hernandez, and uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, how to design a website, uh, you know, a visually appealing website uh, using CSS3. We'll talk about some uh, basic design principles, web design principles, as well as uh, a little bit about progressive enhancements, uh, which is something that uh, is very popular nowadays, uh, and we're going to more detail about that in just a minute. Uh, as I said before, I'm Mario Hernandez. I'm a front-end developer and web designer. I uh, I work for the federal government. I'm a, a front-end developer there, and I'm also running my own independent freelance business uh, under designsdrive.com. And uh, I've been using Drupal for about four years now, and uh, I'm not looking back. It's just the best thing out there. Uh, I tried uh, Joomla, WordPress, LiveRay, and uh, Drupal is just bar none uh, the best out there. So uh, you can reach me on my website, uh, you know, email, Twitter, LinkedIn. And uh, <clears throat> as I said before, I've been designing websites. Uh, it's been over 10 years now, and, uh, you know, it's... it's the design landscape has changed so much, and it continues to change. Uh, a lot of that has to do, especially uh, lately, uh, it has to do with, uh, with the mobile devices. It's, it's a whole new revolution now. And the, the demand for well-designed websites or products, web products in general, has increased because of mobile devices. Uh, with the introduction of mobile uh, browsers, you know, like uh, the iPhone when it was introduced about five years ago, that completely changed everything because now you can see a website as a as an actual website on your mobile device. So the demand for design has increased. So people who never paid attention to design before now are having a hard time trying to keep up and be able to deliver uh, uh, to those demands. So today we're going to talk about some principles that hopefully will help you, you know, get started with uh, what to look out for uh, when it comes to web design. We'll talk about some progressive enhancements with CSS3, how you can enhance your website uh, while still providing a, a practical experience for those browsers that do not support uh, some of the techniques that we'll discuss in today. So, uh, great design. Uh, and by the way, you know, first I was thinking, should, I, should, should this class be about de designing a theme, a Drupal theme, because we're at Drupal camp after all. But I figured... There's other classes out there. There's other material and resources out there that you can take advantage of for how to design a theme. I wanted to mainly focus on the design part of a website because design is global. It's international. It's, it's universal. So uh, once you have those principles in mind, uh, then you can apply them to any platform, Drupal, .NET, anything else. So, you know, great design, basically. Uh, a product that is well designed, it really gives the sense that it really works well. You know, if you look at if you look at a product that uh, is poorly designed and doesn't look very trustworthy, you you probably associate that with you know this probably doesn't work really well. If you go to a website that uh, really has no usability uh, in mind, or things are hard to find, or or it's not well designed, you know people don't necessarily trust uh, that kind of website. So, but if you go to a website that uh, is very well put together, there's a lot of attention to detail you know, you'll have a, a better time of, you know, adjusting and, and be able to trust that website. So, um, so I wanted to make sure that uh, we all understand that. So when a website is uh, designed properly, it gives the sense that it's also easier to use. You know, if you go to a website such as MailChimp, for example, very straightforward. You know, uh, it's easy to use, intuitive. Uh, they have beautiful selectable colors. Uh, so it gives that sense that uh, this is a, a product that, uh, that you can work with uh, uh, for what your needs are. <clears throat> there are a few elements of uh, web design uh, that really can make the difference between a great looking website and, and a mediocre website. Uh, I started talking about this topic about a year ago at the uh, Code Camp. You know, this is a conference for, especially for .NET developers. Uh, that happens every year at U, uh, uh, USC. And I was talking about these four elements of web design. And just a couple of months ago, there was a book released. I don't have the title of the book, where they also talk about these very same topics that I'll be talking about. So it, it gives me a sense of uh, uh, 
it makes me feel great because you know those are the same elements that I've been discussing for the last year. So uh, it tells me that I'm pretty much on track on what uh, what that means. Uh, the first element that I think is critical for design, not just web design, but any design in general, is color. And uh, you know, it's not necessarily use every color that there is. It's just the ability to be able to properly use color. Um, you know, sometimes one or two colors will do just perfectly for a website. If you look at the Apple website, you know, the, 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 the number of colors that they use is very minimal. It's, you know, some, some shades of gray, white, black, uh, and, and that pretty much is the actual design itself. Their products, you know, of course they have more colors and things, but the design itself is very simple. Um, there is, uh, there might be other websites where they use a lot more colors and that pr probably works well for them. Uh, it all depends on, you know, what they, uh, your website is about, what your uh, target audience is, and, uh, and that's what uh, you determine what colors to use. There's a great source for uh, being able to create your own palette of colors. Uh, uh, that is colorlovers.com. And uh, the palette that you see here, Design Drive, that's actually the one that I created for this design that we're going to be looking at today. Uh, and it's great because you can save this, give it your name, and uh, you can always reference back. You can share it with other people. So you'll be able to create your own color palette. So you make sure to stay on track of those colors that you want to use on your design. The other element uh, that I think is very critical on design uh, is texture. You know, a lot can be accomplished on a website by simply adding uh, some texture to to the graphics, you know, to the typography or to the background of your website. Uh, a great source for um, for textures uh, that I found is this uh, website, subtlepatterns.com. Uh, they give you uh, tons and tons of nice little background textures that you can use on your website. Very subtle. Uh, there's some dark, some light, but really, really nice. Uh, we'll be using one of these textures for our uh, design today. Uh, the thing is not to overdo it. You know, you, you don't want to overdo the texture because oh, then it becomes something else that you really didn't have in mind. Uh, the, the third element of web design, great, great web design, is white space. You know, um, interesting because I, I said that I've been talking about other groups before about this topic, uh, .NET programmers. And any .NET programmers here? Or... Uh, the culture is completely different than what you would expect to see on a, a Drupal community. Um, I work with uh, uh, programmers uh, that are also .NET, and I can see the differences between the Drupal, the Drupal community and the .NET community. Uh, one thing that I've noticed is that uh, a lot of the programmers, hardcore programmers, uh, because of the, they never focused on design before, uh, they're, they, they try to fill every space on their canvas with something, regardless of <laughs> whether it's relevant or not. And uh, I used to do that also. You know, I, I would put uh, Google Ads or, or something else on, on, on anywhere on my page just because I couldn't stand for an area on my page that had no content at all. And if you look at the Apple website here, you know, this is uh, a page that is just it's beautiful. And look at all the empty space that you see there. It's just uh, the point here is the product. They're trying to showcase their product. And they make it a point to not add too much to the page, keep it simple and as simple as possible. Uh, the, the, the last element that, that I think is critical uh, to web design is typography. I am a huge, huge fan of typography. Uh, I mean, I drive around looking at billboards or posters on the stop buses, uh, or you know, when I go to Target and I see this, all these signs that are there, you know, their products, it's just beautiful, beautiful typography. And I think, uh, in fact, our design that we're gonna be looking at today the reason why it stands out is because it's typography. Uh, anybody's watched the Helvetica documentary? Okay. Uh, if you have Netflix, I would highly recommend it. It's a, it's a documentary about the Helvetica font, which is what you're looking at here. It's the history of the font, how it was created, and it's, it's very, very um, inspiring, at least to me. So, um, you don't want to do, overdo the, the typography either. You know, you want to keep it to very minimum, two or three types you know, of fonts maybe will do fine for your website. Uh, it's just how you use them on different areas of your website. And in a minute you'll see that uh, I, I hope that I, I did accomplish uh, being able to restrain myself from using uh, just minimum uh, number of fonts on my, on my design. <clears throat> so uh, I think those principles, you know, a color, texture, white space, and typography can really 
enhance the, the, the look of your website if you really uh, measure how you apply each of those uh, on your design. <clears throat> the, with those principles in mind, now we can move on into trying to accomplish uh, some sort of beauty on our design. And uh, for that, we're going to be using CSS3. And the question is, um, is it safe to use? You know, a lot, one of the misconceptions out there is that uh, not all the browsers support CSS3. And, and that is absolutely right. Now, the difference is, though, uh, CSS3 is a set of modules, just like Drupal. You know, you don't have to use every module out there in Drupal. You only use the ones that you need and the ones that work. So CSS3 is no different. Um, the thing that you need to do is to make sure that you identify this, those modules or properties in CSS3, make sure that you do a research on how the browser support these uh, properties, and then you can apply them to your design. Uh, you don't want to overdo it, of course, because uh, it's very easy with CSS3 to go crazy and do all these really cool things, uh, but again, you want to keep that, some sort of measure on that. Um, as I said before, CSS3 is a series of modules, and uh, in a minute, I'll show you some of the ones that we'll be covering today and what their browser support is. So you can rest assured that what you're using will be supported, at least for the majority of the browsers. IE is, uh, I don't even get started with that because, uh, yeah. Anyways, but, uh, uh, so keep that in mind that if, if somebody tells you, you know, I can't use CSS3 because it's not supported uh, for all the browsers, uh, it all depends on what you're trying to do with CSS3. Um, Progressive enhancements, and I'm going to let you read this first uh, before I move forward with anything else, because uh, this is what we'll be using, and this is what pretty much any designer out there is using uh, when it comes to designing their website, is being able to uh, provide a better experience uh, to the user on those browsers that, you know, that, ha that provide more features, or so have better support for CSS3, while still been able to provide a fallback method for the browsers that do not support those properties. And by browsers, I mean IE. So, um, so anyway, so that's what uh, the key is. You don't want to sacrifice your functionality of the website just because you want to use a CSS3 property. You want to make sure that what you use will not break your website. So that's very, very important. So um, here we go, CSS3, you want to focus on the experience layer. You don't want, again, you don't want to <coughs> start manipulating the functionality, the user experience of, of the website just because you want to use a CSS3 property. Focus on the properties that are widely supported. Uh, do not sacrifice the, sac uh, the functionality, as I said before. And here is a breakdown on some of the areas where you can use, when it's, when, where it's recommended that you can use CSS3 and where it's not. The critical areas is branding, of course. You don't want to completely uh, mess with the branding of your product the usability, accessibility, and layout, those need to work regardless of the browser. But there are other areas that are a little more flexible, that even though may not be supported by all browsers, not being supported by a browser will not break your website. And that is in the interaction, you know, how the user interacts. Uh, let's say we're talking about round buttons or round corners on a button. Well, if IE doesn't support round corners, that's okay. The button will, should still work. But just because it doesn't show us round, doesn't mean uh, the user is not going to be able to use your website. The visual rewards, that's what I was talking about, feedback and the movement. You know, there's a lot of effects that you can use with CSS3, and uh, are they really necessary? Are they really necessary to the point that if IE doesn't support those effects, will your website still function? And that's the key. Has anybody seen this uh, before, this domain? <laughs> What do you think the answer is here? It's funny because if you go to this website and you try it on different browsers, all you see is the word no, but even that word no shows differently depending on which browser you're using. <laughs> uh, so, but the point is that it's okay. It doesn't necessarily have to look exactly the same on every browser, as long as, again, your, your website still functions. So anyways, I, I thought that was kind of cool. So here are some of the properties we'll be going to be touching on today. <clears throat> and next to them is the support that they offer, or the, the browsers offer, for each of those properties. Uh, this is a set of properties that's pretty safe to use nowadays, today. Because as you can see, 
the, the support of the browser is very, very, very well. So uh, we're going to be using, I think, uh, pretty much all of this on our design today. Again, the, the key here is to not overdo it because, you know, I've been designing websites for a while. I, I know CSS fairly well. I'm not an expert. I'm not a professional at it. But I know it very well that I can do a lot, a lot of really cool, tasks, cool things with CSS3. So it's really easy to go crazy and do all these cool things. So the hardest thing is to stop myself and keep things simple because my personal style for design is simple, clean, minimal. So when I know that I can do a lot of these crazy, funky things with CSS3, uh, it, it's very hard to uh, really not be able to do them on my design. So um, I wanted to show you uh, very quickly uh, what we're going to be not building because I already have it built, but I want to take you step by step on how some of the things were accomplished with CSS3. Uh, and then I'll come back and share with you some resources that you can go and uh, tap into for learning some of these techniques, resources that have helped me tremendously. Um, so I'm going to show you, we're going to discuss first briefly uh, about grid systems. Anybody has used or is familiar with grid systems? Or anybody who is not familiar with grid systems? Um, grid systems, uh, in fact, for that, let me, let me actually show you real quick. Let me move this here. Anybody heard of Foundation before? Foundation is a CSS framework uh, that is super awesome. Highly, highly recommended. What it is is it's a set of predefined properties for you to use. Uh, things like predefined styles for buttons, tables, navigation, uh, forms. And it also includes a grid system. And the other thing is that it's also mobile friendly. So when you use a framework like this, almost out of the box, your website automatically is mobile friendly. Uh, it uses what is called the responsive web design technique. Everybody uh, know what that is? Uh, so, so I use this framework to do our design today. Um, so the, the way this works is if I go into, um, actually, let me see, it's the features. There we go. So here's the grid system. Basically, the grid system is a set of rows and columns. Uh, this particular framework uses a 12-column system, you know, but there are 16 columns, 24 columns. Uh, this 12-column is probably one, one of the most popular ones. And you use the grid system to be able to lay out the structure of your website. Um, you don't have to worry about padding or margin in between uh, sections of your website because the grid system handles all that for you out of the box. So it's funny because when you start using grid systems, you're not longer thinking on pixels. Uh, for example, if I want a sidebar on the right here that I want it to be maybe about 25% the width of the entire website, I can just say something to the effect of I want it to be four columns wide. I don't care how many pixels that is because four columns out of 12 columns is basically 25%, well, it's a third of, of the website. But you get my point. Uh, if I want the main content area to be about 60%, 65% of uh, the width of my entire site, I can say I want that content area to be eight, eight columns wide. So now you're thinking more in terms of columns. You're not thinking about pixels anymore. Uh, if I want my header to be the entire width of my website, I can say I want my header to be 12 columns wide. So this is just a very simple intro to grid system. I highly suggest that you look into this. And it doesn't have to be this. Uh, this just happens to be my personal favorite one, but there's a lot of ones. There's a Twitter. Uh, has released their own uh, framework. Uh, it's called Bootstrap. Uh, there's also the 960 grid system. I don't know if some of you have heard that. I've used uh, all of those. Uh, the 960 comes with a fixed width, uh, 960 pixels, and there's also a fluid one. So uh, I've used both of those also. But lately I've been playing around with this and uh, I think I'm going to stick with this for a while because it's really, really cool. It offers, as I said before, it offers all sorts of uh, predefined styles. For example, we, we talked about the grid. We talked about typography. So out of the box, when you create a website using this framework, your typography is a pretty much already styled for you. You can always change this. You can always overwrite any of the properties that the framework offers, and we'll be doing that today. But the point is that 
if you want to just keep it the way it is, it will it will look perfectly fine. Uh, buttons, you can take advantage of predefined buttons already that are part of the grid system by simply applying uh, the class of button to your anchors or, or to your actual buttons, and that automatically would inherit. You can say a button, a large button green, then your anchor automatically turns into a large green button. Um, we have forms, which forms are very tricky to style and, and not very attractive, but this framework makes them look very, very attractive. If you look at the, some of these things that they've done here. Um, there's also navigation. This is very, very cool. It's got predefined styles for navigation. And this is all out of the box for you. All you have to do is apply the, the, the right classes to your elements, and you automatically inherit uh, the, um, the styles that they've uh, predefined. Um, tabs. And, you know, some people have objections about using frameworks. Uh, and that, that's, I, I, I agree with them. You know, because not, a framework will not solve all your problems. And, and a framework will not work for every project that you work on. Sometimes you, you're going to have to create things from scratch yourself. But uh, it's a good starting point for those projects that lend themselves to a framework. So um, I highly mm -hmm. recommend that you look at them. So it's got things like labels. Oh, let me labels and alerts and things like that. Anyway, so you get the point. Uh, so, so this is what we're going to be using today uh, for our design. And here is our design. Right now, I have not done anything to this. I've done zero style. And just looking at it, I mean, still, you know, still workable uh, without any intervention at all. Uh, if I scroll down, this is what you see. Okay, and we're going to turn this from this to this. This is a mock-up that I a mock-up that I designed for. I've been using it for a year now. It's changed every time I talk about this topic. I have to update the code because things keep changing all the time. But so I worked on this so much that I, I think I'm just going to use it for my own website, my own website, because uh, it's gotten to the point where it's, it's, I think it's, it's, it's to a point where I I'm liking it a lot now, <laughs> um, and I invested a lot of time into it. So I think I might just keep it for my own site. But uh, it's free out there. I'll, I'll provide you the code. You'll be able to, to take it with you. So hopefully nobody beats me to use it first before I use it. <laughs> but anyways, so so this is what we're going to be using now. The thing to keep in mind is. And I don't know if the projector, oops, I can't move too much here. Do you guys see a shadow on the, on the blue text at all? No. OK. You're missing out. And this is projector's fault, by the way. There's a big, thick shadow on that blue font that you see there. It's just, it makes it look really, really beautiful. And when you look at it on your browser, you'll be able to see. Uh, but all this is CSS3. There's no images there. The only images that you see there are those little thumbnails that you see here. Okay, these are the only image. Everything else is plain CSS3, with the exception, of course, those little icons that you see there. The button is all CSS. Um, but let me show you for a quick some of the things that I've done here. Uh, if you look at the navigation here, you have your straightforward, you know, up state and active state. But when you hover over, I don't know if you guys see that. There's a slightly transition of, of the hover effect. It's not just uh, turning from one color to the next. It's, there's a transition there that you see there. Yeah. Again, that's, that's all CSS. This, um, this font that you see here, I don't have this font installed on my computer. This is uh, what's called a web font. Anybody familiar with web fonts? Web fonts, um, and Google has a tremendous, I think the list is up to 400 or 500 different fonts that you can use for free from Google um, and uh, what's happening here, the font is being rendered from the server. It's not actually, it doesn't require the user to have this font installed on their computer. If you go to google.com slash web fonts, you'll see a huge list of all these fonts. This happens to be called the uh, lobster font. Um, and you say, I want this font. They give you the code to put on your, in the head of your uh, HTML page. And then they give you the CSS property to use when you want to use the font on your, on your design. Uh, same goes for the headings here. This one here is also a, is a web font that I'm using. Uh, this is the uh, is it League Gothic or Gothic League. That's, that's one of my favorite fonts. 
Um, again, um, it's, a, it's a web font. It's not something that I have on my machine. Uh, the thumbnails, uh, if you look here, as I hover over the thumbnails, there's, that, again, that transition that you see for the hover effect. It's all CSS. Is that URL uh, reachable from here? Yes. It's, um, let me see if I can, uh, let me see if I can bring it up here. Um, no, I haven't done anything for the mobile piece of this, uh, because that's, that was not the part of, the, the, of this topic, but that's the URL there. I don't know if you can read it or not. It's thesciencedrive.com slash talks slash DrupalCamp LA2012 slash index.html. If you bring it up on your computer, you'll be able to see that, that shadow that I told you about, the font on the, on the page. It's pretty, I think it's beautiful. The, the font itself, not that I did it, but the font. Um, if I move down, uh, we have these blocks again. Uh, what you see here is those elements that we talked about before. We, used, we talked about color, and I think, uh, at least in my eyes, it looks like it's a good compromise of color scheme here. Uh, we talked about white space. You can see that there's plenty of space in between each element of, this, of the design there. Uh, there's texture on the background. You probably can't see it on the projector, but if you look at it on your computer, you'll be able to see the texture. Very subtle, which is, that was exactly the idea. It doesn't have to stand out. It doesn't have to overtake the design, but it's there uh, uh, for you to see. And finally, the typography. I mean, if, if as I said before, what, in a way, what makes the design stand out is the typography, is because uh, the different ways of the same font being used uh, on different ways. Down here on the footer, we have <clears throat> just a plain footer, uh, but also some uh, CSS3 uh, transition uh, effects there. The icons that you see here for Twitter, Facebook, and that's one single image. Uh, have you guys know, do you know of uh, CSS sprites? CSS sprites is when you can combine multiple images into one, uh, and there's many reasons why you want to do that. Uh, one is because, you know, you load in one single image instead of loading four or five images, so there's less request to the server. Uh, and if you're looking at a mobile device, you know that makes a lot of sense because your page will load faster. Uh, there are also uh, if, uh, the other reasons will be if you're using images uh, for your navigation, you know the top navigation, uh, the app state navigation, and the hover state navigation. Uh, if you're using multiple images for those, there will be a hesitation when you hover the, the link because the, server, the site needs to go back to the server and grab the second image to show you the hover effect versus if you're using a single image, uh, the image is already loaded for you. So when you hover over the link, the, the change of the hover effect is in instantaneous. Um, all you do is basically you, you, sh you only show the, the area of the image that you want to display on any specific area. For example, here on the, on where it says contact Mario Hernandez, those icons, it's one single image, but I'm saying for the uh, for the web for the email address, show the envelope, just show the envelope, hide everything else, and then for the Twitter part, just show the little bird, don't show anything else. So it's just about the uh, uh, you simply using the the um, coordinates of each image uh, uh, and then apply them uh, to your design. The the button here is all CSS. Uh, the only image is the little. Uh, pointing down arrow there, but the wrong corners, the gradient, that's all CSS. Uh, the, the next page that I wanted to show you is the contact us page. Here, you know, I, I just put this just for, for fun, but what I wanted to focus on, and, and, and unfortunately this, the, the projector doesn't show things really well here. Um, maybe I can... Um, I'll, I, I'll change this a little bit, but what, what, I, what I've done here is there's a, f a form um, that stands out from the page. It's got a nice back uh, border, like a, a, like a shadow. And each of the elements, like the, each of the text boxes, it's got the round border around it. When you click on it, it shows you the, or when you hover over, it tells you where you are. The same for here. And there's the submit button there. Uh, the projector doesn't justify, by the way, what, what this looks like. So when you look at it on your computer, you'll be able to see. So um, so let's, uh, any questions before we start putting some of the code together to make this uh, happen? Yes? I have two. Um, what you were talking about was called uh, above the fold. 
Above the fold? Above the fold. It's, um, right here. Which one was that for? Uh... It's just like web design, uh, understanding the principles of successful web design by Brian Miller. Oh, that's the one? Okay, yes. So, yeah. It's, it's called Above the Fold. And second, how do you go from page to page as far as home, sponsors, uh, sessions, training, contact, as far as like a template for the site? Oh, uh, well, this is plain HTML, so the only pages that I focus on is the home and the contact us. But uh, what what do you use for your uh, design or your or your projects? What what platform do you use? Do you use Drupal? Uh, no, just HTML, CSS. Okay. If you use plain uh, HTML, you will have to duplicate the code on every page, unfortunately, because there's no unless you use a template. Uh, I don't know if you use Dreamweaver or not. With Dreamweaver, you can create your own template, and then have the navigation predefined, uh, and basically in, do an include right on every page that uses a template. So the navigation will basically only be created once, but uh, it, it shows on every page. In this case, I'm doing exactly what you do, which is I'm copying some of that code on each of the pages. Uh, but on Drupal, it would just be a simple UL list that I will style to, to, to make it do this, and that will be the end of it, yeah. yeah. So, um, so anyway, so here we are. This is the, um, what we started with. And again, because of the framework that I'm using, I mean, this, I mean, it's, it's decent. It's, uh, you know, people will still use it and it will still work. So let's start applying some of the elements that we, um, that we uh, need to do to make it look a little bit better. So here's the project that I'm working with. Uh, you know, uh, I'm down a contact us page, um, index page. There's some images, JavaScript. I'm not using any JavaScript at all. That's just what comes with the framework. Uh, and for the style sheets, uh, most of this, everything is, comes with the framework, with the exception of the custom that CSS. I don't know if you guys can see that. Custom CSS, that's the one that I use to do my own styles and to override some of the things that the framework is doing for me that I want to change. So um, here is the HTML page. This is the markup. And uh, again, because I'm using the grid system, uh, you'll see things that may not make sense to you if you're not using the grid system, but things like this, seven columns. That, that, that I'm telling the system that I want the navigation area to be seven columns wide out of the 12. Um, things like um, the preface, you know, where that big, um, where it says visually appealing web design, I want it to be 12 columns wide. That means I want it to be the, the entire width of the website. Uh, so that's what the grid system does. But let's, let's start with, um, um, Again, this is what the framework offers. It's out of the box. It's HTML5 compliant. Uh, it's got all these preconditions for IE. I've seen, I mean, look at this. It's all IE stuff, just so you can. I mean, you don't have to do that. The framework already comes with that for you. Uh, but let's start, and here's the contact us page. Uh, same, same thing. Here is our custom CSS file that we're going to be using to change the look of our design. Again, I wiped everything out. Uh, but uh, I'm sure you didn't come here to see me type, so I have a lot of this here. So I'm just going to go and start with um, some of the basic stuff, nothing special here. I'm just overriding mainly some of the headings that the framework um, um, the settings that the framework has. So I'm going to go there and refresh this. And all I've done here is basically use, instead of using the Helvetica font that the framework comes with, I'm using my own font here. As you can see, the headings for each section now is starting to take different shape. Uh, the links have changed colors now uh, to this nicely orange color here. So that's all I did there. Uh, and nothing special, but let me see if, there's, if I can see. There's nothing really here that uh, you need, really need to see. The texture file that I told you about is just a little GIF image that I'm repeating. And uh, the, 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 the font stack here, uh, it's always a good idea, of course, to use fallback font. You know? So this, is, this font stack is one that you can actually get, um, I think it's from css-tricks.com, and I'll show you that website in a minute. It's, it's called Better Helvetica. It, it puts all the possible combinations of Hel Helvetica font, but it also adds some fallback fonts like Arial you know, or Lucida Grande. Those are fonts that are probably there on, on most people's computers. Helvetica may not be, but uh, that's why those fallback fonts are there. On your page one tag right there, it says, I guess, uh, three rems. Is that just another? Yeah, that's, um, 
It's RAM it stands for root M's. You know, you know what M's? The M's are a relative font size. So instead of using pixels, you use M's. Um, and the reason for that is, especially if you're dealing with mobile, uh, with responsive web design, you don't want to use pixels for your font sizes. You want to use a font that is relative, that it will adjust to the size of the screen that you're using. Um, there is an article about using RAMs. Uh, the problem with M's is that as you start using M's on your nested elements, like uh, if you have a UL list and you start using the, uh, um, within the list you have other elements, the font starts to get smaller and smaller because it's being relative to the, to the parent uh, container. What the RM uh, does, it, it, it stands for root M's, which means that the fonts will be always relative to the entire root of the site, not to the parent uh, element. That's what that is. And there's an article that I can point you to to, to look into that. It's really, really great. It's, very, it's widely used nowadays, uh, this technique. Yes? Is it compatible back quite a ways? Like all the browsers that's compatible? Yes. If you look at uh, what I've done here, look at the H1. I said font size. Can you guys read that, by the way? Yeah. yeah. Font size, 30 pixels, right? And then as I'm repeating, font size, 3 rems. So if the browser doesn't understand rems, it will use the previous one, 30 pixel ones. Any other questions before? On that one, which is it? I mean, is it going to read the 30 pixels first, or is it going to read the three, the three Well, ramps? the browser that supports RAMs, it will obviously read the 30 pixels first, but then it will read the next one, and, and the last property is the one that takes over. Yeah, the last property always uh, overrides the previous one. In fact, that's how we're overriding uh, the H1s, uh, all the headings from the framework, because the framework H1s or H1 through H6 are the ones that are rendered first, but then the system looks at my uh, CSS file because my CSS file comes last. And it says, okay, this is the last property, so I'm going to use the last one. And that's how I'm able to override what the framework offers. And I'm sorry, uh, let me go back here. If you look at the index page, here is the, um, here is the foundation CSS file. This is from the framework, and this one is too. And in between, I put the, the two uh, from Google. Remember I told you about the Google fonts? This, uh, those are the two CSS file references that you need to put there. But the very last CSS file that I'm using is mine because I want my properties to be rendered last in case I want to override something from the framework. Um, so let's grab some more. Uh, let's, let's, this is the top bar. This is the navigation, basically. Let me grab this. This is quite a bit of... Uh, uh, that and actually let's, let's start here all I'm doing here for the top bar is giving a back, uh, dark background uh, making the color uh, some dark gray uh, some shade of gray turn them uppercase and here's where I'm using the other um, font that I, I use for the headings it's called the Oswald but in addition to that, I'm adding some fallback fonts in case Oswald is not available, or if somebody's looking at my website offline for whatever reason, uh, then they still have some way of look, showing some font there. Um, nothing special here. I'm simply um, doing a box shadow. This is a CSS3 property. For the fonts, I'm giving it a little bit shadow, and because it's the the bar itself is dark, it's very hard to see, but it's, it's, it's more clearly to see when you do the hover effect. And unfortunately, on the, on the projector, you won't be able to see that very well, but on your computer, you will. Yes, sir? So I'm, I'm new to see it. So font families, it looks like you're, you're actually choosing it first uh, and then pulling back uh, successively. But the others, you know, you're, you're, you're using them in the last. Uh, I'm sorry, repeat the question again, sir. I'm sorry, I didn't get it. Okay. Is that? Did you get your answer? Okay. Good. Um, I'll show you, by the way, some resources uh, on some of the slides where you can go and grab all of this markup. Um, for example, this. How do you know that this is what you're supposed to type? You know, what does that web kit means? And uh, because, as I said before, um, CSS3 is not supported by all the browsers. What a lot of the browsers vendors have done, like Firefox, uh, WebKit, like uh, Safari and Chrome, they've created their own what is called prefixes. So the official uh, property of CSS3 for creating a shadow on the text is, is text shadow. But that property is not widely supported by all the browsers. So 
Chrome uh, or Firefox have created their own prefix and say, for I want to support that property and I want to add my own prefix. So when you see WebKit, that means those are browsers that are built in the WebKit framework, uh, like uh, Safari and, and Chrome. There are other properties that you'll see that'll say uh, Moz, M-O-Z. That's the prefix for Mozilla. And those are prefixes that the browsers have created so they can support those CSS3 properties that you see here. This particular one, the text shadow, I'm sorry, the box shadow, is, is one that, uh, see, as you can see there, M-O-Z, that is the same equivalent for, for the Mozilla browser. And then this is the official um, property that you want to add that last because when this property becomes supported by all the browsers, you can just remove the previous two and leave the official one there. Um, so that's what that does. So I'm going to refresh my, my screen here. So again, all I did here was re reduce some of the margin that was on top and made, a black, uh, made the, the, the entire bar all across the site added um, um, the, make the text cuts and, and that's pretty much it. Uh, I'm going to go and specifically into the navigation now and this is where some of the effects start to um, to appear. Um, I'm going to go a little quick because we're running low on time. Um, navigation, very straightforward. Um, dark background, same color. Um, the box shadow the hover effect. Uh, what, what, what I've done here is the transition part of the navigation. You start with uh, some sort of a is, is, is in and out, and you can use many transition methods. You know, the, uh, CSS3 offers various methods that you can use for transitioning. This is just the one that I picked in this case. And I, I've changed the, um, the um, it's four seconds, it says here. And the opacity, uh, if you see here, the color is this here. This is the RGBA. This is RGBA stands for red, green, black, blue, I'm sorry, and the A stands for transparency, the opacity. So I can say I want this to be black, so it'll be 0, 0, 0, for example, but I want it to be maybe 50% of black, so it'll be transparent at 50% of the black, so it will not be 100% black. And all I did at the end, here, let me see, hover, I'm changing um, the color slightly just to a different um, uh, level of transparency. And if I refresh, did I save this? No. So there's my active link because I gave it, a, and uh, if I hover over, that's when you see the transition there. Let me move forward. Look at this uh, text here, the, uh, the big tagline that I have visually and, what is it called, clean and visually appealing web design. It's just plain text. All I've done here, let me show you the code real quick, um, is let me find that real quick here. All I've done is apply different classes to each of the words, each of the words that I want to style independently from each other. For example, here's the word clean. So I gave uh, the, the entire, everything is wrapped in a, in a span. So the class is thin. And here's the ampersand. See this? That's the ampersand. And I gave it a class in a, in a span of ampersand. And then visually appealing, it's got the class of, um, where did it go? Oh, I'm sorry. The same as thin, but the web design has got a class of thick. So when I go to my CSS, sorry about that. I'm going to grab the, the preface here. We start from the top here. Um, so the preface, that's just the container of the, the whole text. Here's the thin part. I said I want to use this font uh, with uh, this here. Actually, this I can get rid of this. I was testing whether I should use that font or not. So um, that can go away, actually, because that's the one I want to use. Uh, the size of the font, again, um, and the ampersand. Now, this one, I found this from a book that I'll share with you in a minute. This is all the possible fonts that you can use for the ampersand sign that will display the ampersand sign the way it does here on any platform, Windows, Ubuntu, Mac, everything, or any browser. So this is a good key, uh, nice uh, tip that I found on this book uh, that I'll share with you. But uh, let me save this real quick. Uh, I know we're low on time now. So, so there's that line of text, a simple little line of text now became something nicer. 
let me show you what, I, what happens. Uh, sometimes the smallest thing can make a big difference. If I change the, the ampersand from, if I get rid of the italic, that's what it becomes. So the ital just turning that one font into italic, I mean, makes such a drastic change because it makes the, the, the ampersand turn into a much a more beautiful uh, symbol, really. So if I put the uh, so if I put the italic back, uh, my ampersand becomes a much nicer looking one. Um, again, let me move on. Let's let's deal with these images here, um, and those are this uh, top. That's the intro. That's the what's on the left of the images. Here are the images. Um, I know that all of this code could be intimidating, but I can guarantee you that. Uh, Again, I'll show you some resources where you can go and grab all of this markup. You don't have to necessarily type it by hand yourself. There's websites out there that you can just say, you know, I want a box shadow or I want uh, a transition for this piece. You go and grab the, 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 the markup and all you do is apply and make the changes you want to do. So you don't have to necessarily memorize uh, what that should look like. Uh, just know where to go grab this because um, it could be overwhelming. I mean, this is just so we can get the transition piece done on our, um, on our images. And the opacity key is the key here. We start with one percent, uh, with one. One is the one hundred percent, basically. So at the up state level, uh, there's no transparency at all, or no transition. But at the hover effect, I change that opacity uh, to to seventy percent, basically. That's why you see that transition happen um, when I hover over the images. And I added some box shadows to show a little shadow under each image. Uh, again, the projector doesn't justify what I've done here, but. Um, you can see that the hover effect there. Uh, I'm just going to go and drop everything else just because uh, we, we don't have any more time. And uh, I'll answer any questions. But I do want to share those resources that I mentioned to you um, so you guys can uh, go in and look at some of these things on your own. Let me just put everything there. So there's uh, the final uh, piece. Uh, the forms, again, is the other thing that I've done. Uh, all of this code is available for you to download, so feel free to do so. Uh, let me bring up the, um, the slides, and then uh, if you have any questions, I can. Um, let me see here. Here are some of the uh, resources that I mentioned before. The first two websites that you see up there, those are websites where you can actually, you can actually go and grab actual code. Some of the code that I was using today, I went and grabbed from there. You know, there's, you can see, you will see all the different properties that you can use CSS3 on, and you say, I want, um, I don't know, I want a text shadow, or I want uh, round corners. And it will give you the code that you want, and you just make the changes that you want based on uh, your needs. These three books, critical. Um, a lot of the techniques that I show you today, I learned from these books. So highly, highly recommend them. Um, let me see what else. Yeah, that's, any questions? Sorry, I went over a little bit. Yes. Um, I have a question. Uh, is there any benefit to doing a lot of these effects through CSS3 as opposed to something like jQuery or other? Uh, the question is whether there are benefits of doing this with CSS3 versus JavaScript or jQuery. The benefit is that it's lighter in weight. You don't have to download third third party libraries. It's all lightweight code. Uh, there are more advanced functionality and techniques you can use with jQuery and JavaScript, of course. But if you want to keep something simple like this, CSS3 is, especially if the support of browsers is what is wide support, I will stick with CSS3 as much as possible. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. You use those REMs for your font size. Can you use that for padding and margins and whatnot as well as the font size? I mainly use, uh, the question was whether I use RMs uh, for uh, padding or margins or just for font size. And uh, I mainly use that just for font size. For padding, uh, especially when I'm designing a mobile-friendly website with responsive web design, what I use uh, for padding is I use percentages for, for, for horizontal padding. And I use M's maybe for uh, vertical padding. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. What is the scale for RMs? Is it starting zero or starting zero? I mean, like ten or I mean, is it 
monitors with 2.2 or 2.8? What is the exact scale? Well, uh, the question is, what is the scale of the uh, uh, RMs? And, uh, you know, 16 pixels is basically the base font size uh, by default. Uh, when you convert that to 100% by converting the, by, by applying the, class, the, the rule of font size equals 62.5%, uh, that be, your, your font becomes 100%. So from that point on, when you start adding... Um, uh, RMs. Uh, if you're using 20 pixels, for example, if you want to convert it to RMs, it'll be 2.0 RMs. If, you, if you're using 14 pixels, but if you want to use uh, RMs, you will use uh, 1.4 RMs. So it becomes uh, that linear uh, rate, basically. And there's, I'll share that, that, that uh, website that I told you about where uh, this person goes into detail about how to convert that uh, and why you would want to do that versus just doing M's. Yes, sir? Uh, do you use uh, SAS? The, uh, the question is whether I use SAS, Compass. Um, I, I am starting to use that. In fact, the framework that I talked about, Foundation, uses SAS and Compass. And uh, I didn't use it for this particular project, but I'm working on other projects with Foundation where I'm using SAS and Compass, and it, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. I found a project on GitHub about it, but I didn't see any mention on the website, on the Foundation Zerg website. Oh, by the way, uh, here's my count. Uh, there is, actually. I, I can pull it up and show you. But, yeah, it's the, the, list, the latest version that they just released a couple weeks ago does focus mainly on SAS and Compass. Okay. Yes. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned CSS sprites. Have you found any kind of tool that would sort of take all your images on that page, create a sprite, and maybe even give you the coordinate information? Is there anything like that out there? Uh, the question is whether, uh, for creating CSS sprites, whether there are tools that will allow you to combine all these images into one and uh, give you the coordinates. Uh, I don't know any tool, but I wouldn't surprise if there is. I personally create my own by hand, but you know because I don't use them heavily. But if I was to have higher requirements for that, I would probably have to look into a tool like that. There's probably one. CSS. The answer to that question is SAS Compass. Yeah. How does that? Okay. SAS Compass was the answer for that. Um, and any other questions? Well, thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Um, do you want me to show you? Um, let's see here. Oh, you know what? Let me we need to unplug. So I'll show you in a minute. So. Okay.